Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker, and in today's video, I wanted to do something a little bit different than what a lot of people do around NBA YouTube. You'll see a lot of list type videos like this, and I haven't done a list video in a while, so I decided to come back to that. But also most of them are about, or a lot of them at least that you see this time of year are about players that are going to break out this season in the NBA, that maybe are lesser known guys that are going to have really big seasons that are going to make them more commonly known players around the league, which is fine, and I enjoy watching those videos, but I wanted to kind of take it the other way and talk about some NBA stores that could be taking a step back this upcoming season. Now, this doesn't mean that they're going to have a bad year. This doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to be a bad or below average player or not be a star anymore, but for a variety of different reasons, whether it be circumstances or, or injuries or just things that have changed around the NBA, these are players that I believe could be taking a step back this year, despite them being seen as some of the true stars and maybe even superstars in the NBA. And with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. First up on the list now is someone that in my opinion, is not all that surprising that they're here and that is Paul George of the LA Clippers. Now, this is a guy that's coming off of an offseason in which he had shoulder surgery on both of his shoulders, and that is going to impact his timetable in terms of when he even starts his season. It looks like right now he's not going to play until November, which will be a couple of weeks into the season if that timetable holds up. But it's not just that. It's the context of this team. He's coming into a new situation where there's a lot of new pieces, specifically him and Kawhi Leonard. How they interact, how they gel together is definitely going to be something to watch. And this team as a whole, I would think regular season expectations would be lowered a bit for them given George's injuries, given Kawhi's uh, need to rest during the year to make sure that he's good to go for the playoffs. Again, all these new players kind of coming together and seeing how everything fits. And even though I think they're a legit title contender come playoff time, in general, I think during the regular season, they're going to be a bit worse than maybe th people think that they will be. And this is also just going to be a different offensive ecosystem that Paul George is going to find himself in. I mean, his usage and his number of shot attempts last year is just simply not sustainable on a Clippers roster that is, that is just all around more talented on the offensive end than what he was dealing with with Oklahoma City last year. More guys should be taking more shots than just him. The offense should be spread around a bit more or maybe even a lot more than it was in Oklahoma City last year. And that in combination with the injury stuff kind of gelling together with this new team, I don't think it's sustainable at all or really realistic at all to expect Paul George coming off of a double shoulder surgery off season. Say that three times fast. Coming off of that, I don't think it's realistic at all to expect him to keep up these numbers, which is why I think he's going to be taking a step back this season, at least statistically, if not on his overall impact of the court. Next up now, number two is Blake Griffin. And I got a lot of heat on my Pistons season preview. People coming at me wondering why I didn't have the Pistons in the playoffs. They made it last year. They got slightly better this off season, all that stuff. And a lot of the reason why I didn't have the Pistons in the playoffs. The first reason was just there are teams that I like better for those six through eight seeds in the Eastern Conference. But the other part is just that I don't really know that you can expect Blake Griffin to have a healthy season again next year. He struggled with injuries later in the year, started to break down. He's now 30 years old. He hasn't played in 70 games in a single season since 2014, with the exception of last season. So a healthy season last year is definitely more so the exception rather than the rule for Blake Griffin's health. And as Funky said on Twitter in response to a tweet that I I sent out about a lot of people giving me hate for that Pistons season preview. It took Blake being healthy and an all NBA caliber performer just for the Pistons to get to 41 wins. And I just don't really think that Blake's going to be able to play that many games again, again, just because of the injury issues. And if he does, it's going to be because his usage is limited and because he's being rested more during the season. They're not going to lean on him as much, especially early in the season. If they need to later in the year, then they definitely will. But I just don't think it's realistic to expect these numbers that he put up last year to continue in a situation in which they're going to want to rest him and limit his usage a bit more. And so again, that doesn't mean he's going to have a bad year. It's just that he had really good numbers last year, and they're probably going to try and scale that back a little bit, which could result in a step back for him statistically, even if he does play a lot of games. And there's also always a looming possibility that he only plays like 40 games for this team, given his injury history. So Blake Griffin is the second player on this list. Moving on now to number three, and this is James Harden. And he's on this for a couple of reasons. For First, his season last year from a statistical perspective is just not repeatable. There's no way that he can sustain that. He went absolutely insane during the year when Chris Paul went down. He kept that Rockets team afloat by just scoring a ridiculous amount of points. And I just don't think that's realistic at all to expect those statistics to continue this season, especially now with Russell Westbrook in town. Russ is going to get his fair, fair share of shots. They're, I don't really think they're going to share the floor a ton, but when they do share the floor, that's going to take shot opportunities and creation opportunities away from 
James Harden. That's just the way it is. You want to make sure that Russ is happy. And uh, if there's going to be a guy you're going to be playing off the ball in terms of a guy that can actually knock down jump shots, it's going to be James Harden. So it's not that I think he's going to have a bad season. It's just there's no way he can sustain those kinds of, of numbers from last year. One, because those numbers were just absolutely insane. And two, because Russell Westbrook is now in town. I expect the Rockets to still be a very good team. And I'm very excited to see these two guys play together in that system. I think it could definitely be a bounce back year for Russell Westbrook in the eyes of many fans and in the, in the eyes of people that kind of take away from him the success that he's had. Uh, but I do think that's going to come a little bit at the expense of James Harden statistically. And even like, for example, even if he, you know, averages eight less points a game than he did last year, that's still over 28 points a game. Like it's insane how good he was statistically last year. And I just don't think that's sustainable at all. Even given the Mike D'Antoni offense, I think they squeezed just about as much as you possibly could out of a league guard in the modern NBA out of Harden last year. And there's just no way that continues this year. So James Harden makes it as a third player on this list. Moving on now to the fourth member of this list, and it's D'Angelo Russell. And I'm expecting to take some heat for including him on this list simply because typically the Golden State Warriors are really good at integrating new players. When they bring in new guys, their system just fits a lot of different play styles really well. And for a perimeter oriented playmaking scoring guard, it seems like D'Lo should acclimate to the Warriors pretty well. But there's a couple of reasons for this that I have him as taking a bit of a step back. One, it's obviously an entirely new situation, which means he needs to get used to his new team and his new teammates but also just in terms of the amount of offensive responsibility that he had in Brooklyn last year compared to with the Warriors this year, it's going to be different. I don't know that it's going to be like 50% less or anything. He's still a very good player and they're going to need scoring and shot creation while they're waiting on Klay Thompson to come back. We saw that during the finals last year. That's understood. It's just he's not going to be the team's primary main ball handling scoring playmaking option like he was so often for the Nets last year. Even though they had other good perimeter players, it was a lot of the times on D'Lo. And the other part of this is it seems like Steph Curry is primed for another near MVP season and I wouldn't be surprised if he entered the season as number two or number three in the odds to win the MVP this year. Because like I said, Klay Thompson is out. They're going to be relying a lot on Steph for their offense, which you would think would also mean that D'Lo would have a lot of responsibility as well. It's just, it's going to take him some time to acclimate. I don't think it's realistic at all to expect that he's just suddenly going to be really, really good right from the jump for this team, given the new situation. And I just think that Steph commands so much offensively, so much responsibility offensively because he is just so good that I don't think he's going to be able to sustain these numbers that he had last year in Brooklyn. He's still going to be good, but in terms of players to look out for that are going to be taking a step back, I'm putting D'Lo in that category simply because of the new situation because I think Steph's going to be insane this year. And last up now on the list is another guard that's in a new situation that's going to take some time to acclimate, and that is Kemba Walker. And this really has a lot to do with just how bad the Charlotte Hornets supporting cast was in Kemba's time in Charlotte uh, and really over the last couple of years, not just last year. I mean, this is a team relying on Kemba and Jeremy Lamb and some other guys to create offense every time down the floor, which necessitated Kemba taking a lot of shots. And he was still really good and honestly remarkably efficient given the fact that he was taking on such a big offensive responsibility for that team. But now in Boston, even though you know they don't have Kyrie Irving or anything like that, they do have some other really good offensive options outside of Kemba and guys like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, Gordon Hayward if he has a good year. Marcus Smart is going to take some shots, things like that. So I'm just expecting this, again, just like most, if not all the other players on this list, mostly from a statistical perspective, I'm expecting a step back from Kemba Walker this season. When you're looking at the point totals that he's putting up in Charlotte, I would expect those to dip by like two to three, maybe three and a half points. I'm expecting a bounce back year from Jason Tatum. I just think that this is going to be so much more of a Brad Stevens style team uh, where the offense is spread around a little bit more evenly than maybe it was last year with Kyrie. And even going back, obviously, a lot of the comparisons have been made in terms of Kemba's game compared to Isaiah Thomas, the Celtics version of Isaiah Thomas, who obviously had an outstanding scoring season with Brad Stevens the year that he made All-NBA and things like that. Uh, but that was without a lot of other offensive talent around him. They kind of needed him to do that. They don't necessarily need Kemba to score 26, 27, 28 points a game to win. They're going to be good defensively. They've got other wings, younger offensive options that they can rely on, and they don't need Kemba to be doing as much as he did in Charlotte. I still think he's going to have a good year, and I think the Celtics team specifically is going to have a good year, potentially better than they were last year from a win total perspective. But statistically for Kemba Walker, I'm expecting a step back. And there you have it. That is going to be the end of today's video. Like I said in the beginning, this doesn't necessarily mean that I think that these players are going to be bad this year. It's just when you look at it objectively and you're comparing the circumstances that they had last year and everything that went in 
to how good they were last year because all these players that were on this list were really really good last year and in some ways had career years for many of them it's just now the nba is much different going into the season circumstances are different for each of them and that in my opinion is going to cause them to take a step back this upcoming season but again don't want to make it seem like this is anything you know wildly negative about these specific players but like i said that's going to be the end of today's video that I, and i thank you all very much for watching once again my name is tucker if you missed any of my pre previous videos excuse me and be sure to check out the boxes on screen thanks again and i'll see you all next time